All right, everybody, welcome back to Apex Mind. Adam with you here as always. And on this week's episode, I am very pleased to welcome to the show, man of many talents, Matt Dix. Welcome, Matt. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, Matt, you know, I said you're a man of many talents and I probably can't accurately cover everything that you do, (laughs) but I I know that um, you are very well known for your storytelling capabilities. You've um, written many books um, and, and I even learned a little bit about you when I was researching you for this. I mean, I didn't know you had a rock opera and and a, a list of talents a mile long. So, um, you know, I know we have a lot of ground to cover in this interview, but, you know, let's start off with the fact that since you have all these things that you do, how do you manage your time um, in, in doing all these things? <laughs> well, uh, it's actually why I wrote my new book, Someday Is Today. It's the question I get asked the most is, you know, knowing all the things that I do, how do I manage to uh, sort of keep it all in order and get it done? You know, I think it's a multitude of ways. Essentially, you know, it all comes down to the idea that people often think about sort of what they want to accomplish in terms of oftentimes oddly half hour and hour increments, or sometimes days and you know, oftentimes things are put off. You know, my, my new book is called Someday is Today because people often say that someday they will they will accomplish this goal. And then what they end up doing is they just die with a bunch of dreams that are utterly unfulfilled. That is the story tragically of so many people's lives. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it is a real construction of my life in such a way that rather than thinking in terms of hours or even half hours, I think in terms of minutes, I, I think in terms of Before I clicked the Zoom link so that the two of us could have this conversation, I I was sitting here for three minutes and I realized I have three minutes. And rather than opening up my phone and staring at a, you know, social media platform that will make me feel sad about my life, I instead said, well, I'm in the middle of the book and let me see if I can write four sentences in three minutes. And I probably wrote about nine because I got into a little bit of a flow and And now I'm nine sentences closer to the end of my book. And if you start thinking about your life in terms of that, suddenly you can get things done that you want to get done. And conversely, you get to spend time with the people you love or doing the things you love as well. I'm sort of not obsessed with accomplishing goals to the exclusion of wrestling with my son and reading with my daughter and spending time with my wife and playing golf poorly. All of those things are equally important to me. Yeah, absolutely. You know, time, I've always thought time is the most valuable resource, but I'm someone who's kind of serially disorganized and I've read books on it and I have planners. I mean, if you see my desk here, I have, but it goes down to 15 minute increments. And I had never heard about the thinking about things in in one minute increments, like you talk about. Um, So how have you done that? How have you been able to be efficient in smaller timeframes? Whereas a lot of us will just scroll the social media feed or, you know, whatever we're doing, looking at uh, websites or whatnot. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of ways that I've sort of managed to hack my life in order to do this. You know, I think that what I try to do is be purposeful and make decisions. And I think what happens to most people in life is they don't actually make decisions about how they spend their time. I think they follow the path of least resistance, which is often there's a computer in my pocket that I can put in my face and stare at things and not have to think about anything else, which is the path of least resistance. And what happens is over the course of time, we end up in a place where everybody else is because everyone else is following the path of least resistance. So I think it's not the bad decisions that we make about spending our time. It's the lack of decision-making. So like one of the exercises I have in my book is make a list of all the things that you can accomplish in five minutes. Because once you have that list in your mind of all the things you can do, now sort of when I'm getting ready to leave the house and my son is looking for his shoes and there's always one in two different rooms. So it takes him a while to find them, you know, and it takes my daughter to find the right book to read on the three minute trip, you know, to the grocery store while I'm waiting by the door, rather than staring at a phone, I have a list of things that I can do. And so I have a book positioned by the door, an easy to read book. It's actually Groucho Marx's letters over the course of his life that I'm reading. That book is by the door. So rather than staring at social media, if I'm waiting for my kids, I can pick up a book and I can actually do something productive or my computer is out at all times. So I can sit down and literally write two or three sentences that get me closer to the end of a book or a blog post or a column that I'm writing, or I can reread the paragraph I wrote earlier that day to see if it's still flowing 
it's just a matter of taking advantage of the time. It's the awareness, like you described, though, that that time is our most precious commodity. And most people say it. The tragedy is in your last days of your life, minutes become incredibly precious. And yet they're just as precious now, but we don't treat them that way. So we have to treat them in the same way we're going to treat them at the end of our life. Yeah, absolutely. And you gave a couple of examples of things that it sounds like you're capable of doing that, you know, a lot of times, a lot of us tend to want to complete a task, but you said you wrote a couple of sentences for a book you're working on, or you'll read, you know, just a few, maybe even not have a full page in a book. A lot of people want to read that chapter, they want to sit down and, uh, you know, have a long block of time for writing. Um, what have you done to kind of get rid of that attachment to completing a task and, and be able to kind of work on in these smaller chunks of time? Well, part of it is the acknowledgement that the attainment of any goal is a thousand tiny steps. It is not four giant steps. And so when I think of it in a thousand tiny steps, it becomes a lot easier to take a tiny step every day if you need to take a tiny one rather than one of those enormous leaps. But I think of it as perspective as well. You know, when I meet would-be writers, people who tell me, well, someday I'm going to write a book, you know, the word someday again. And they say, I can only write, you know, in two to three hour increments. And I'm really great between 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. And I like a coffee shop. I like smooth jazz and a cappuccino. I've had people actually say all those things to me many, many times. And I always remind them during World War I, there were men wearing gas masks in trenches as artillery was exploding over their head. And they had small notepads and pencils and they were scribbling stories that they hoped would one day find a reader if they managed to survive this battle. So your need for smooth jazz and a Starbucks cappuccino and a three hour block of time is just utter nonsense. It is the desire to have a life that you view as productive rather than the actual productivity that fills most, most writers' lives. Because if you wanna write like I want to write, you'll write in every crack you can find because you desperately want to put words on a page. And if that's not your desperation, maybe you're chasing the wrong dream. And you know, I think that is a problem for some people too. They're, they sort of misidentify what they wanna do because they look at what other people are doing, especially sort of like the, the television version of that job. And they think that's the job for me. But when they actually find out that writing a book is mostly about keeping your butt in a chair for a long period of time, that does not appeal to too many people. Sure. And and that World War One analogy is interesting because I, you know, I know that Tolkien started writing his Lord of the Rings epic while he was there. And and I think about another fantasy writer. I, I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with Brandon Sanderson. He he writes a lot of fantasy fiction today, and he's known for his amazing output. And you'll watch his YouTube videos where he's doing QA with the fans and he's signing books at the same time. He's maximizing that time. You know, and I think it's that same concept of what you're talking about there. But I do want to touch on you. You talked about that that reflection when you get older, and and I think a lot of us start thinking about these things as we get older. And I know you have a, a concept in your book about you know asking yourself what the hundred year old version of you would want to do. Do you want to share what that that means? Yeah, sure. I mean, it came from a really unfortunate incident in my life when I was twenty one years old. I was the victim of an armed robbery. I was managing a McDonald's restaurant and three men broke in after midnight after the store was closed. And, you know, they met me at the safe and the safe that I was sort of working with, it had a compartment at the bottom that I could not open. There was a placard on the compartment that said manager does not have key. And that's where the bulk of the money was that we had earned that night. I had already dropped it into that compartment and I had no access to it and they didn't believe me. And so, you know, they put me on the ground and they put a gun to my head and they said they were going to count to three and then they were going to shoot me in the head and then they began counting. And these were men who I knew had already killed other people. The police had actually come and told me to be careful that these guys were, you know, doing this kind of thing. And so as that man started counting to three, I truly believed in all my heart that I had reached the end of my life. And lying on that greasy tile floor, I was shocked that the only feeling I felt, I felt no fear, I felt no anger, I didn't even feel sadness. The only feeling I had was regret, regret for the things that I had not done. And so obviously I survived, they pulled the trigger on an empty gun and sent me into 
you know, two decades of PTSD, mm -hmm. but you know, in an odd way, they gave me a gift that night as well, because I came to understand what it feels like at the end of your life or what you think is going to be the end of your life to look back and think you have not accomplished nearly enough that the dreams you had, whether that dream is to have a garden in your backyard or to, you know, read the great American novels that have been produced in the last 200 years, whatever your goal is, you know, make a great egg sandwich, whatever it is. If you don't do that thing by the end of your life, it is enormously painful. And if you speak to hospice workers, they'll tell you the same thing in the last days of people's lives. The thing they talk most about is regret. We regret for chances not taken, for opportunities not you know, taken advantage of, for people they allowed to drift from their lives, those kinds of things. And so what I developed was what you described, this 100-year-old plan where I look ahead to my 100-year-old self. When I have a decision to make, how am I going to spend this afternoon? What am I going to do when faced with this choice of doing something or not doing something? I look ahead to the 100-year-old version of myself, the one that I perceive to be on his deathbed. And I ask him, how should I spend the next two hours of this day that I've suddenly been given? Or someone's offered me an opportunity. It looks really hard and challenging. And frankly, I'm not that interested in it. Should I take it? The 100-year-old version of myself never says binge Netflix. The 100-year-old version of myself never says spend more time on social media. The 100-year-old version of myself never says close the door on that opportunity. You know, that version of me says forget television, forget social media. And when someone offers you an opportunity, even if it's something that doesn't necessarily appeal to you, at least give it a chance before closing that door. And so ever since I've been doing that, since I was 21 years old, my life has changed completely because we're just unreliable in the present. You know, if you asked me how to spend today, I would say cheeseburgers and golf. That would be my perfect day. Eat three cheeseburgers, play 18 holes of golf, hang out with my son, wrestle him a little bit, you know, kiss my wife a lot and read with my daughter. The hundred year old version of myself says easy on the cheeseburgers. Golf is fine, but not every day. Right. And by the way, you want to write some books and you want to tell some stories and you want to build some businesses and you want to make sure you leave something so that your kids don't have to work as hard as you did. So let's make sure that happens too. So we have to look ahead and play the long game. Yeah, that's great. And I know you mentioned both, uh, you know, streaming, watching streaming and social media. And I think those are things that a lot of us tend to talk about when we're saying, Hey, let's get rid of these time wasting activities and do other things. But I know you also mentioned um, being able to like streamline or cut out more routine tasks. And that's something I think a lot of people don't focus on when they think about maximizing time. So what do you yeah, recommend I, for that? Well, my wife probably pointed it out correctly. You know, I, I managed McDonald's restaurants for nearly a decade and McDonald's is predicated on the idea that we eliminate as many steps as possible in every process so we can produce as many cheeseburgers in an hour that we need to. So one day she, we were watching the movie, The Founder, about McDonald's, Ray Kroc, and she, we saw this sort of ballet that was being constructed in the kitchen. She paused the movie. She goes, that's why you are the way you are. And what she was talking about was just the idea that when it comes to any task that I have to complete, I try to find the fastest way to complete that task. And I experiment until I find the fastest way to do it. So, you know, I probably spent three months experimenting with every possible way to empty my dishwasher until I managed to reduce the amount of time it takes to empty my dishwasher. Now, a lot of people think I'm insane to spend time doing that, but I'm going to empty the dishwasher for the rest of my life. And I'm probably going to be in this house for 20 years. And I empty the dishwasher just about every day right now because the family fills it up. And so if I can preserve four minutes a day by emptying the dishwasher in a more efficient way, four minutes a day over the course of the year adds up really quickly. And I can use that four minutes. Now, if I'm thinking in terms of minutes, I'm not going to waste the four minutes staring at social media. I'm actually going to do something with it. I'm really compounding the efficiency. And so that comes down to everything from tasks that we do to even decisions. Like my friend just took a new job and I said, what's the commute like? And he said, oh, I haven't figured that out yet. And I said, that would be the first thing I would figure out because your commute is part of your work day. You know, I live five minutes from the elementary school where I have been teaching for 24 years. That was purposeful. I decided I'm not going to get the house with central air or the house with the extra bedroom. I'm going to get the house five minutes from my school because boy, my friends who have an hour commute versus my five minute commute, that means they have a 55 minute 
work day that longer than I do. It's terrible. And yet people discard that. They think that a little more money is worth the commute that they make. Now, sometimes it's unavoidable, but for goodness sake, at least make that part of the decision-making process before you change your job. So we have to take time into account in everything that we do and try to minimize the amount of time we're doing things that we don't want to do, like emptying dishwashers and commuting to work and all the other multitude of tasks that fill our lives. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, I, I think a lot of us noticed some changes to our lives with these last couple of years and just the um, impact that the pandemic had. Um, I know for personally, like I, I started working remotely. A lot of people did. I, I built a uh, gym in my garage because my gym closed down. And it it's amazing how much time we used to spend just going here and there and, and wasting time. So, I mean, is that a, a big suggestion you, you give to people is cutting down on commutes and, and routine nonsense like that? Yeah. You know, one of my favorites is grocery stores. You know, I know people who go to like six grocery stores. They're like, the fish is good here and the chicken's good here. And I get my bulk stuff here. But if I took the fish from their favorite fish grocery store and the fish from some other grocery store and I cooked it both up, it is very unlikely that they would notice the difference between the two fish. That is like a thing that is in their head, but not in reality. Mm -hmm. And so like for me, my gym, before I also started working out at home, when the gym closed, it was the closest gym to me. It wasn't the fanciest. It wasn't the cheapest. It was physically the closest to reduce my travel time. And I have one grocery store that I go to and I've learned where every item is in that grocery store. And I attempt every time I go into that grocery store to set a record for the least amount of time spent in the grocery store. Just go into a grocery store someday and watch the people in the store. It's astounding the way that they move. It's as if they want to be in the grocery store. Just watch people in a parking lot. Like even in a parking lot, I am moving quickly because I acknowledge that the last place I think on the planet I wanna be is a parking lot. And yet I watch people stroll through parking lots like they're strolling through parks. And I just think the, the minute that you took in the parking lot longer than I did, you've lost that minute. Like somewhere down the line, I'm spending an extra minute with my son and you spent an extra hour, an extra minute of your life with asphalt. Like it's just a, enormous difference when you start thinking in those terms. Again, I'm not proposing that people sort of make themselves crazy to get as much done as possible, because I do believe that so much of the efficiency I'm trying to squeeze out of my life goes immediately into my family, my friends, and the things I enjoy doing other than the work that I do. Yeah, you know, I feel like a lot of people, and you mentioned this earlier, but it's almost like we're just passengers in life. We're not you know, intentionally thinking through things, we're just going and then it ends up being time wasting. And, and the grocery store is a great example. But I also, you know, whenever I go to a sports game, I'm always the person that leaves a little bit early just to beat that crowd out because I'd rather not wait 30 minutes or 60 minutes in the parking lot. If I can, I, I'll watch the, the updates on my app that'll tell me what the final score is. And I'll save an hour of time and get a little bit more sleep that night versus the person that has to see the end of the game and then wait in the long lines. Yeah, well, I'm a Patriot season ticket holder. So I'm at eight games a season. I was actually at the preseason game a couple of weeks ago with my son. We left early. He was annoyed by it. I told him, listen, this is a preseason game. Now, if the game's close, I'm staying till the end, right? But the joy of football for me is not only watching the football game, but that is a day spent with my friends. Mm -hmm. So I know that even if I get to my car and I'm stuck in the parking lot for 45 minutes, I'm stuck with my friends in a car and that's actually joyous time for me. Spending time confined with my friends in conversation is half of the reason that I go to a football game, truly. Now, if it wasn't, I would either take football out of my life in terms of attending games live and certainly just watch them in my beautiful living room television, or I would leave early like you. But because I acknowledge the joy of the day, and the joy spent with friends, the 45 minutes doesn't hurt me because again, I'm being purposeful about my time. Whereas so many people, as you said, don't, they just, they just move through life. Like it's irrelevant. Yeah. Yeah. And let me, let me be clear. If, the, if it's a game where something matters or right, you know, of something course. I'm passionate about, I would <laughs> yes. say I, I was at a Colorado Rockies game the other day and they're already out of the playoffs. So you no, know, that's one of those things where let, let's get yeah. out a little early, right? By the seventh inning, you're good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so you also, I've, I've heard that you don't like the phrase, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. And that's a phrase that I think a lot of people give a lot of 
positive credit to. So what is it that you ha- take issue with with that phrase? I think the problem I have is the implication that you're going to make something good. I think that my preferred phrase is don't let the perfect be the enemy of progress because creative people, people who want to make things, whether that thing is a book or you want to you know, create a sculpture or put a garden in your backyard or whatever you want to do, make the best egg sandwich there ever was, we have to acknowledge that creativity through that process, we're going to make a lot of terrible things. People don't do things because they're afraid of the imperfection that they may create. I try to teach people that you're going to make a lot of terrible things. You should expect that many of the things you do will turn out poorly, particularly early on in your creative career. So I don't like perfect being the enemy of good because I just don't think there's a lot of good that's made from people, at least initially. You know, my first six attempts at novels were all failures. I never let anyone see the see them. The only thing I had was taste. I got 20,000 words into a book and I realized it was terrible and I moved on to something else. So I wasn't letting perfect be the enemy of good. I was letting I wasn't letting perfect be the enemy of like progress, like words on a page. That was my goal is to just apply words to a page until those words seemed good enough. And eventually I managed to publish novels, but we have to make a lot of terrible things and people are so afraid of failure. Uh, again, they stare at Instagram and they see perfection and they look like they look at someone like me and they say he's published seven novels and two books of nonfiction. He must be standing on some mountain. You know, he must have been born on high. And I remind people that I started writing when I was 17 years old and I have not missed a single day of writing since I was 17 years old, without exception, without exaggeration, every single day I have written. And it took me 17 years of practice to write my first novel or to publish my first novel. So I was not born on the top of the mountain. I was born probably deep in some muddy valley and I managed to crawl my way out through hard work. But if someone had told me that the first thing I was gonna produce would be good and it wasn't, uh, that would have been disastrous for me. So, So make lots and lots and lots of terrible things. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, you know, I know earlier you mentioned um, the 10,000 tiny steps, and that kind of helps fuel how you work in these small increments. Um, You know, out here in Colorado, we have a lot of peaks that are above 14,000 feet. They're 14ers, and I've climbed a few of them. And I always think about, you know, it looks like it's this really high thing, and it is. Each one is tough, and it takes you a long time. But really, the way you get to the top is you just put your foot in front of the other. And you just keep doing that long enough until you get to the top. And that sounds like a similar process that you take to achieve all the things that you've achieved over time. Yeah. I tell people you need a horizon point. And I like that metaphor because I do worry when people sort of have a specific goal that they, that they desire um, and they can sort of see it perfectly because I think what often happens in the pursuit of something creative is that we don't always land exactly where we wanted, but something adjacent to it. So I say, pick a point on the horizon. Mine might be write a novel and then begin the 10,000 tiny steps. But if at the end, maybe I don't end up with a novel, maybe that novel becomes a screenplay instead, or maybe it becomes a musical, or maybe, you know, maybe it becomes a children's book and not an adult novel, those kinds of things. We also have to be flexible as creative people to acknowledge that our initial vision might be a little bit off or that flexibility increases our chance for success. If we must write the adult novel, right? And we don't manage to do it. We've sort of stuck ourselves along one path as opposed to somewhere out there, I wanna produce a book. I'm hoping it's an adult novel, but if it ends up being a children's picture book, that would be a lovely thing too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's all practice, right? And even I'm sure those ones that that you worked on early in your writing career that never got published, that was still a valuable activity from you, for you that you gained from. I mean, would would you say that that was still something that that helped you later on down the road with your writing? I can still speak with great clarity about the mistakes of those novels, the things that did not work and the approaches that were sort of nonsensical and purposeless. So yes, I can, which with each one of those books, which I would never want anyone to see, I know exactly what I was doing wrong and thereby I do not do that thing wrong again. I might make new mistakes, new and previously undiscovered mistakes, which I certainly do, but I'm at least putting those rotten mistakes behind me and not having to revisit them. Yeah, and and you know, I. 
I work in the corporate training and development space. And a lot of people I see in, in this realm, like, especially like the instructional designer type folks sometimes will have that perfection. I, I need to have this be a perfect product before I release it to the world. And I know um, you also, you've mentioned this, you're, you're a teacher in elementary schools. So um, what, what in that context, context, what are you do? What are you doing to make sure that like, you don't want to disservice the people you're teaching, right? So how do you, I guess, forgive yourself for a lack of a perfect output with the people you're, you're teaching? Oh, uh, well, I guess I'm just always looking for strong, meaningful relationships with my students. And if I get that, that's all I kind of need. I am not the best lesson planner. I'm not the best deliverer of pedagogy. You know, my goal in life is to get my students to trust and essentially love me in the same way that I trust and love them. And then I can get them to run through walls for me. You know, I'm actually in that same space that you described. And I'm in the process of finishing up a corporate training program on storytelling. And I actually battled the same thing you described because I've been recording these videos of myself in a studio that I built in my basement. And I've got a marketer and a builder working with me. And they are saying, Matt, just produce the videos. Stop worrying about the perfection. We want to get a beta out. We want people to see it. We want to see what they think. And in my heart, I was thinking, I don't want them to, I don't want this, them to see me unless I'm outstanding. And I had to say to myself, wait a minute, you're not even doing what you tell people to do. And so finally I let it all go. And I said, fine, I'll just, I'll just make the videos, we'll put it out, and then I'll improve it later. But it took me a minute. I I needed to hear myself say the foolishness of it needs to be perfect before I recognized, oh, what are you doing? So, so even I can fall into these traps, but happily uh, I got out of it quick enough. You know, we all do, I think at, at times. Um, and and it, this links to something else I know I've heard you say before is that nobody's paying attention to you as much as you think they are. Um, <laughs> And I think we think, oh man, if I deliver this product, whatever it is, whether it's a training or a sculpture or whatever you're creating, if it's not as perfect as you think it is, most people aren't going to be as worried about it as you. So do you want to uh, expand on that concept of, of that? Yeah, there's some social science behind it. It's called the spotlight effect. And it is the idea that we always think people are paying more attention to us than they are. And it makes sense because we are the main characters in our own lives or the protagonists of our lives. So we naturally assume we are a significant figure in other people's lives too. And they run all these experiments that prove otherwise. You know, they'll send a they'll send a college student into a class wearing the most outrageous shirt you've ever seen in your life. And they'll have that kid sit right in the middle of the class for an hour. And then the class leaves and they interview every member of the class. And, you know, they ask the kid who's wearing the shirt, they say, how many people do you think noticed the ridiculous shirt you had on? And he said, well, almost everybody, I'm sure. And it turns out almost no one ever notices anything because no one's paying any attention to anyone. We're all just sort of focused on ourselves. And as soon as you can accept that, and that's a hard thing to accept for a lot of people, but once you accept it, you're not afraid of failure anymore. You're not afraid of mistakes. Frankly, you stop caring about what you look like. Now, I'm not saying, you know, eat 19 cheeseburgers and let yourself go, but it means that when you go out and you want to like accomplish a goal, like go grocery shopping, you know, if you look at your clothes and you realize, well, this shirt has a stain on it and my hair looks bad and, you know, I'm wearing my slippers, I don't care because I know that nobody is really paying attention to me. I just had a conversation with a CEO and, uh, you know, she was sort of worried about some things she didn't need to worry about. Frankly, she was worried about what she was going to wear at a big talk she's giving. And I asked her, I said, the last time you attended a wedding, when was that? And she said, six months ago. I said, do you remember what you wore? She said, yeah, I actually went out. I got a black dress. I was, it was a real pain in the butt. I had to find the right dress. I found the perfect one. I said, great. I said, at that wedding, what was anyone else wearing that night? And she said, I have no idea what anyone else was wearing that night. I said, do you think that they know what you were wearing that night? Are you so arrogant to think that you can't remember a single thing that was worn except for the bride's white dress? And yet for some reason, they remember your black dress? Like no one remembers anything and nobody cares. And that's the truth. Another CEO I was working with, she's getting ready to launch a series of newsletters. Every Monday she wants to produce a newsletter. And she said, if I don't get far enough ahead, Matt, then what happens if a Monday comes and I don't have a newsletter? I said, do you really think people are sort of hovering over their computer at 8 a.m. every Monday waiting for your newsletter to arrive? Like if it doesn't show up, 
No one's going to notice it didn't show up. It'll show up the next week and they'll be like, oh, there's the newsletter again. Nobody cares. And as soon as we can let go of these things, suddenly we make things that aren't so good, but at least we're making some things and we stop worrying about what people think. So failure or the fear of failure goes away. All of those things can happen once we buy into the reality of the spotlight effect, which is absolutely true. Nobody is looking at you nearly as much as you think. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's also true of our work. It ties into the perfectionism, um, really good stuff there. Um, I want to make sure we have some time to talk about your storytelling background because um, y- you have, I-, I believe these are current numbers, 56 time moth story slam champion and nine time grand champion. And, and are those current numbers that I pulled there? I think those are probably correct. Yeah. Okay. So for anyone at home that's listening, that may not be familiar with the moth story slam can can you give us a little background on what that is sure well the moth is the sort of the granddaddy of all storytelling organizations it's an international um organization dedicated to the art and craft of storytelling and so in these competitions that i attend you basically stand on stage and you tell a five minute story on an assigned theme and then judges determine who is going to be the winner that night so 10 storytellers tell stories and then there is one a winner declared and from those winners eventually they move on to a grand slam championship where you compete against other former winners for the for the top prize in storytelling they say so um so i do that quite a bit awesome well and, and i would imagine with all of those uh wins that you have you're you're very good at this so um you know i noticed that a lot of the stories that i hear people tell are focused on the events that happened, the the facts that were involved in it. And I know um, one of the things I really enjoyed when I read your book, Storytelling, I read it about a year and a half ago, is that the most important thing about a story is that you're a different person at the end of it than you are at the beginning. So what do you mean by that? Well, you know, what you described really is what most people think of as storytelling, which is reporting on your life, which is not a story, right? So you come home from work, your partner says, how was your day? And you proceed to tell them what your day was like. That's not a story. It's just reporting, which is fine if the person loves you, but if they don't love you, they don't want to hear it. So a story has to be about change over time. I used to be one kind of person and now some stuff has happened and I'm a different kind of person. It doesn't need to be an improved person. You can actually decline. That's a great story. I used to be good and now I'm bad. That's fine. Uh, you know, oftentimes it's, I used to think one thing and then some stuff happened and now I think a different thing. The joy of that is as soon as you recognize that that is what a story is, and it doesn't take much effort to figure this out, just read a book or watch a movie and you'll discover, you know, almost without exception, every single movie is a character at the beginning who was one kind of person. And at the end, they're essentially somewhat the opposite of what they started at. They have to make some progress over the course of the movie in order to achieve the goal that they're looking to achieve. The same thing with books. Once we acknowledge that this is true, now we don't have to look for stories that are filled with car chases and crazy first dates and you know scary plane rides and things like that because we change all the time someone says something to us and suddenly we feel something shift in us in a way that that it you know we didn't realize my kids just this week we were in the car and i told them something to the effect of if you guys don't knock it off i'm going to punish you and they laughed and i said why are you laughing and they said dad, you're the easy parent. You're the soft one. Mom's the hard one. And I couldn't believe it. Like I am an elementary school teacher who knows how to punish kids. I don't mind punishing kids. And I discovered in the car that my kid's perception of me is I'm the soft one and my wife is the hard one. And that changed the way I view myself as a parent and kind of as a human being. And now I have a story to tell. And all it was, was a conversation in a car with my children. Nothing happened except everyone was seated and talking. And yeah, I'm going to craft that into a story that's going to be deeply meaningful to a lot of people. And I know it's going to move people uh, because I know what happened inside of me in that moment. So it's the acknowledgement that stories, some of the best stories in the world, if you were watching the person experience that significant moment, you would never know they were experiencing a moment because quite often most important stories happen inside our heads and it has nothing to do with the externalities, the things happening around us. So that means you have tons of stories to tell. You don't need to have crazy things happen to tell a good story. Yeah, that actually segues well into the next question I wanted to ask, but it's funny you mentioned movies and TV shows. We've seen the hero's journey done a million times and it's been done so many times so well. And, And I think it's 
it's easy for someone to dismiss the things that happen in their life and to, um, you know, I don't have these grand things happening. I'm not saving the day. I'm not doing these things. But you you mentioned that story in the car of where your children helped you realize something about yourself. So you changed in that moment. Um, I, I think this kind of leads into an activity I know you give called homework for life. Um, and, and that has been something that's helped me to capture those little moments. So do you want to share with everyone what homework for life is and how they can use that to capture those, those real moments of change in their life? Yeah, it's the most important thing I teach in the world, truly. It's for storytellers, but it's just for life. It's just it will change the way you view your life for the rest of your life. You know, I, I assigned myself this homework years ago. I'm an elementary school teacher, so I'm sort of my inclination to assign homework. But I was a storyteller who had a big list of stories to tell, and that list was getting shorter and shorter every day. And I knew I had to find new stories to tell. And so what I decided was simply at the end of every day, I would sit down and ask myself, what's the most story worthy moment from the day? Even if the day really contained nothing story worthy, it was a boring, ordinary, eventless day, I would still force myself to find a moment. The, the prompt I really use is I imagine someone has kidnapped my wife and kids and they will not give my children back until I take a stage and tell a story about something that happened today, even if nothing happened. And then what I do is I write it down. I don't write the whole story down. That's insanity. You'll, you won't keep up with that. But what I use is an Excel spreadsheet, but you can use anything. Essentially, I limit my writing to the length of a computer screen. I've got the date in one column and then that B column, I stretch across the screen. And in that B column, I write my story. So it's only four sentences, five sentences. You know, that day was in the car. Uh, I threatened the kids with punishment. Clara and Charlie tell me, I'm the soft parent, Alicia is the hard parent. I can't believe it. That's it. That's what I write on that day. It's a moment of meaning for me. Not every moment that I put in my homework for life becomes a story. I actually did some calculations recently. About 10% of the things that I put into my homework for life become actual stories I'll tell on a stage someday. But many of them are anecdotes I will share with my friends on the golf course. They're you know, little moments I'll share with my wife. It also just allows you to retain your life in a way that we don't, you know, just play this terrible game, you know, take your age, whatever it is, and let's subtract 12. So I'm 50, subtract 12, 38, right? So whatever your number is, how much do you remember from that year of your life? For me, my 38th year of your life, whatever your number is, oftentimes in a workshop, people will cry because they can't remember anything from a full year of their life. And it's not because they didn't live a full year, you know, complete with lots of, you know, memories and things worth holding on to. It's just, we throw away our memories like they're meaningless. Homework for Life says, you're not allowed to do that anymore. Every day gets marked in some way. And now that I do Homework for Life and thousands of people all over the world do it, and it's not a unicorn situation. Thousands of people truly, almost every day I get an email from someone saying, I'm doing Homework for Life, it's changed my life. What happens is I probably average about five entries per day now, five things that I see in my life that are, I want to hold on to that. Even if I never tell a story about it, I want to hold on to that so I don't forget it. So it makes you remember your life in a way you don't. And then the other added bonus, which I never expected was when you start like viewing your life through the lens of storytelling, you're looking for things that are making you feel and think differently. Suddenly the past will reappear for you. You sort of crack open. And all of these stories from the past, things you can't believe you forgot will suddenly return. And I add those to my homework for life as memories from that day. And that is joyous because then you start filling in the past. You feel like your life is more than what you originally thought it was because suddenly you see all the things you've done in the past. It's a very important thing that everyone should be doing. I have a TED talk on it. If you want to hear 17 minutes of how to do it with great specificity, just Google the phrase homework for life. Watch my TED talk. That'll get you started. I cannot recommend it more. Absolutely. I, you know, I, and I know it's not a unicorn thing because I've been doing it since I read the book about a year and a half ago, and it has helped me to have more gratitude to, um, you know, just really capture things. I've never been a journaling type person, and this is the closest I've ever done to journaling. And, and I agree that it does, op you'll make connections to past things because of um, the things you're writing down from each day. So it, it's a great activity. Um, I, I think everyone should do it. And I'll, I'll make sure I link to that um, TED, the TED talk in the show notes so that people can go directly there too. Um, I know 
another thing you say is every story is about a five second moment in a person's life. And it's so funny because you're telling this longer story. So what is the significance of that five second moment? Well, the five second moment is sort of that moment of transformation. It is the moment of change. I call it a five second moment because I really do believe as much as much uh, or as many events that may lead up to the moment, ultimately there is a moment and I think it's singular. I, I call it five seconds. I think it's one probably most of the time where everything flips. For me in the car with the kids, you're the soft parent dad, that's it. It flips for me in that second, right? Now I have to find a way to tell that story, but that's what I'm looking for is those singular moments where I suddenly feel something change in me, either the way I think, the way I perceive myself, the way I look at the world, the moments when your hair stands up on the back of your neck, the moment when you feel the chill down your spine, the moment when your kids say something and you're like, oh my God, am I really the soft parent? You know, and immediately I go, I am the soft parent. They're right. Right. And then it's the question I always ask myself is, why do you do the things that you do? Which is a great question. People should ask themselves all the time. Why am I the soft parent? And immediately I have a story and it's because my childhood was really difficult. My childhood was a mess. It was not a stable and happy time in my life. And I am the soft parent because all I want to do is make my children's childhood glorious, you know, as opposed to mine. Whereas my wife had a glorious childhood. She had a blissful childhood. So she has no problem inserting a little pain into my kids' lives because she doesn't understand what it's like to have nothing but pain, right? So it's that differentiation. That understanding though, that came to me in that car, in that moment, changes my life. It changes the way I see my wife when she punishes our kids. And I think, oh, why are you doing that? Leave them alone. They're just little, right? They do need to be punished sometimes for bad decisions they make so that they don't make the same bad decision again. And I recognize sort of my wife is a lot better at it than me because of who I was as a child. And maybe I can be better now, but um, we're looking for singular moments. Watch movies because movies are the same way. There's always a moment at the end when Harry met Sally, right? The movie leads up to the moment that finally the two of them kiss, truly in love, right? That New Year's Eve kiss they have. It takes two hours to get there, but the moment they decide to be in love, it's a singular moment. Harry has it first. He realizes, oh my God, I love her. And he runs to her. He sees her and he says, I love you. He does his great speech and she realizes, my God, I love him too. But it's in a five second moment that those people change their minds. And that's how our lives are, I believe. Yeah. I mean, there's a, any good movie has that moment, right? And and I know superheroes are all the rage, but you look at at the end of this this Marvel thing and, and Iron Man snaps his finger and sacrifices himself and realizes after all this time of him trying to run away and, you know, raise his family in the woods. No, he had to be the one who steps up to save the universe. Like that, that's the five second moment is when he sacrificed himself and it took 20 some odd movies to get there. Right. Um, no matter how long that story is, it still comes down to that moment of the self-realization and the self-change. Right. And he starts that movie. He starts the series of movies as an arms dealer, ruthlessly selling arms to whoever will buy them. At the end of the movie, he snaps his fingers. He sacrifices his life for the universe. The beginning of the, the first Iron Man movie, Tony Stark never does that. He never, he wouldn't think of doing it for a second. At the end of the movie, movie, he's changed. Actually, I'll tell you the moment, my favorite moment, my favorite moment in those Marvel movies is the moment when during the Battle of New York, um, Captain America tells Bruce Banner, I think, you know, doctor, I think you need to get angry. And he turns back and he says, that's my secret. I'm always angry. And I, I paused it. I told my wife, I said, that's it right there. That is the story of Bruce Banner. He is a man who cannot be who he wants to be. And he's angry all the time. And it's the first time he ever admits it to anyone. I told her I am almost in tears in the middle of that ridiculous CGI battle of New York because a man turns and admits something for the first time to the world. And I just think that is a beautiful moment in a crazy superhero movie. And I think those movies are filled with them. Those singular five second moments. I think why the, that's why those movies are so successful because it's not just a superhero movie. It's individuals making difficult decisions and changing over the course of time as a result of it. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think that's why they are so successful. It's not because of the superpowers and the explosions and the aliens. It's because each character is a human that is growing and they're usually flawed at the start. Like you said, Iron Man, the arms dealer or Hulk, the guy who couldn't control his rage, you know, but they grow and they learn from that. And I think we can all learn from those. And and I think that's why people all over the world are resonating with those stories. Um, yeah. And, and they're all flawed people. Like you say, they're all sort of problematic people who manage to do things despite their problems. Absolutely. Um, you, you go over a ton of different storytelling techniques. And really, if anyone at home wants to know them all, I'd say get the book and read it. But there's one that I did want to touch on, which you you recommend in times when it's appropriate to lie when telling a story. And, and I think some people might hear that and they might have concerns about that. So when is it appropriate? And what is the value of lying when telling a story? Sure. So when I like the word lie, because it sort of piques people's interest. What I'm really talking about almost exclusively is omission. So I've never put something into a story that didn't actually happen. I've never invented a fact. I'm a novelist anyway. I invent entire novels, you know, in book form. So I love storytelling, my personal storytelling, because it's like a puzzle. I am trapped with the facts and I now must find the order in which they will make the most sense. Lying in storytelling amounts to taking things out of the story that don't serve you. And that is, you know, one of the most important things storytellers can do. Because if you've ever heard someone telling a story and you just wonder, you know, why are you telling us this? It doesn't seem relevant. It probably isn't. And so when I'm crafting a story, I'm trying to figure out what am I trying to say in the story about my kids? I've never crafted the story before, but what I'm trying to say is, I discovered I'm the soft parent and it's because of my childhood that I am soft today. That's essentially what I would be trying to say in my story. And so everything in that story must serve that one goal. And that means if we were on the way to a baseball game, to a baseball game that Charlie was going to play and win or lose, all of that goes away from the story because it's irrelevant to the story. Instead, I'm in the car with kids and it doesn't matter where we're going. And it doesn't matter if there was another person in the car, if Charlie's buddy was in the car with us, I would get rid of Charlie's buddy because he doesn't serve a purpose in the story. So we eliminate the things that are distracting, that don't serve us, that slow stories down. You know, my favorite example is eye color. I have heard 1000 stories where people tell me the color of the eyes of a person. And by the end of the story, I realize the color of the eyes of that person. It was not relevant to the story in any way. And it's so frustrating because if you tell me I met the girl and she had piercing green eyes, I'm now holding on to that fact throughout the story. I'm remembering she has piercing green eyes. And if at the end of the story, her piercing green eyes are irrelevant to the story. You forced me to hold on to a fact that proves to be meaningless. So the only things that go into stories are the things that serve the stories. So we can take out anything we don't need without any concern whatsoever. So that's what amounts to lying in storytelling. It's taking out characters and events and moments that don't help us tell the story we're trying to tell. Yeah, that that's great. I, I wish I could give my mother that advice. She always gives me these very like overly long and detailed stories about, you know, her doctor's appointments and the hotel she's staying in. But you know what, I actually don't mind it too much because it's my bonding experience with her and she wants to tell me her drawn out stories. But I think what your point is, if you're trying to sell, uh, tell a story that's effective and leading somewhere. Then, then maybe not have all that extraneous info in. Yeah, well, um, if you know what you're trying to say, it saves everything. Absolutely. Me knowing I'm trying to say I'm the soft parent because of the way I was raised as a child now tells me what goes in the story and what doesn't. The problem is most people don't start at the end of their story. They start at the beginning and they really don't know where they're going. So they don't make decisions about what to include and not include because they haven't actually said to themselves, what am I aiming at? If you just take a second and it will become second nature to you if you do it enough, which it is to me now, you just say to yourself, what am I trying to say? And then all the decisions along the way become a lot easier. You realize what you don't need to say or even which, where to start a story. You know, first graders start every story with the alarm goes off and I get out of bed because in a first grader's mind, every story begins with the morning they get out of bed. Even if the story happens at nine o'clock at night, they have to get out of bed in the morning. But weirdly, adults do the same thing. You know, if you go on vacation and while you're in Colorado and skiing, you break your leg and suddenly fall in love with the person rescuing you. We don't need to hear about you getting on a plane in New York City. We don't need to hear about the flight. We don't need to hear about the five days before you broke your leg. Start the story with, I'm going down the slopes 
when I hit a tree and break my leg. Start there. We don't care how you got there. We don't care how long you've been there. The point is I break my leg. Someone comes to save me. I fall in love with them. And now they're my spouse. That is the story. Start as close to the end as possible. Is When you know what you're trying to say, those decisions become easier. Yeah, that's great. And, and let, let's shift over to, um, you know, really a lot of this audience is, is in the business world. And I know that not only you've been a teacher for a long time, but you also consult and work with a lot of different businesses. So, you know, a lot of the storytelling that, that you're talking about is either you're, you're doing it at your moth competitions, or these are stories that you can tell at a dinner party. Do you see differences between that type of storytelling and the type of storytelling we do in, let's say, an executive presentation? Or maybe I'm training people and I'm telling a story. What are the differences or similarities there? It's mostly similarities. I today consult with you know, many Fortune 100 companies, companies you interact with every single day. I'm, I was on a call for three hours today with a company that I am confident you interacted with today. Uh, and the storytelling principles are all the same. It is, we're preparing a keynote for a marketing department for a big talk we're giving in front of 8,000 people. And we need to start at the end because that's where stories start. And we say, what are we trying to say at the end? What's this product and how's it going to change people's lives? And then we go all the way back to the beginning and say, okay, what was the world like before the product, right? So that's essentially when Harry met Sally, it's they weren't in love and now they are in love. It's the product didn't exist and now the product does exist. Uh, we use the same skills of suspense and surprise along the way to hold people's attention. We create wonder by um, building some intrigue and leaving things strategically out and then revealing them later on. I do a lot of coaching with um, professionals on the importance of sharing yourself within your talk. It is so common for me to be working with a marketing department whose goal is to create a deck that can be delivered by everyone, which is essentially a deck that no one ever wants to hear. You know, most of the most of the work being done in the corporate world today tends to be white, round, and flavorless because that's safe. And so it's the people who are willing to be a little different and a little daring. The, the companies who are willing to, you know, build a marketing plan or a sales plan or an advertising plan that is specific to the person delivering it or affords opportunities for people to share something of themselves. So it's not just a corporate monolith presenting information to me, but oh, it's a human being. And I have so many stories of moments where, you know, my favorite one is I was working the, with the director of a company and uh, she came up with the new marketing plan for her company on a napkin. She wrote three words down on a napkin on a Tuesday night, two glasses of wine by herself, lonely at home. She suddenly has an idea and writes it on a napkin. And it's a brilliant marketing plan, which really transforms the company in significant ways. And when we're planning the, the marketing plan, I say, you have to tell the story about the Tuesday night and the two glasses of wine and you lonely and you writing the three words on the napkin. And she said, I'm not doing that. That's crazy. And so she didn't. Now, the, the plan worked just fine. But one day she had to roll it out to a smaller audience, less stakes. I said, can we please take the photo of the napkin and can you include that one minute little bit? And she did. And she said she has never received more responses from people after presenting a marketing plan to some customers as she did when she talked about the two glasses of wine and the lonely Tuesday night and the napkin. She said, I can't believe it. Like people called me, they emailed me, they reached out on LinkedIn, like all of these people. I said, it's because you were a person, because everyone understands what it's like to be lonely. Everyone understands what it's like to be two glasses of wine in on a Tuesday night because you've got nothing to do. And everyone loves the idea that inspiration sometimes happens on a napkin because it happens to us too. We have moments of inspiration. And so when we can infuse ourselves, a little bit of ourselves into the actual work we're doing, so our audiences see us as people, and not just, you know, any other person from XYZ company, everything changes. And so I'm always pushing people to find ways to say things about themselves in the course of doing the work they're trying to do so that people will believe them, trust them, connect with them, you know, love them. Um, that's the kind of work I'm doing with people today. Yeah, that's beautiful. It makes me think about like corporate Twitter accounts and how a vast majority of them are just stale and boring. And even though they may have a lot of followers, they have no interaction. And right. then you see like one, like a Wendy's where they're Wendy's. actually fun and yeah. they get tons of interaction. 
right? And most companies would say, we can't do that. That's dangerous because humor is, is bizarre in corporate America because everyone wants to be funny. Now I do stand up. So then I give them ways to be funny and no one wants to do it. They want to be funny until the moment they have to try to be funny because being funny is risky because if people don't laugh, you feel bad. And so rather than risking having people not laugh at you, they just don't attempt to be amusing in any way whatsoever. Even though we know that funny people are per are perceived to be more intelligent, more likable, more trusted. Like when you make someone laugh, they like you. The reason my wife married me was because I made her laugh 100%. There's no other reason why that fantastic woman should have ever attached herself to someone like me, except I told a good story and made her laugh. And yet it is like pulling teeth to get someone in the corporate world to attempt to be mildly amusing. Yeah, it's 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 rough sometimes. Um, when I also help, you know, a lot of, we have a lot of people who listen to the show who um, are, are in the corporate world of teaching or training or enablement, do you find there's any different elements when the story has to also teach instead of just entertain or, in, you know, inform? Well, I think the stories that you're going to tell that will help you teach should also be entertaining. Anytime we are in front of an audience, whether it is two people in a room, 10,000 people on a Zoom call, 50,000 people in a, in a theater, whatever it is, we should be entertaining first, 100%. So that means... If I'm going to use a story as a means of illustrating something in some corporate training seminar, which I just two weeks ago at a biotech firm, I'm going to be entertaining. I'm going to tell a story that people love. That's going to make people be connected to me automatically. They're going to be like, wow, we have to spend eight hours with this guy, but the first seven minutes were great. That was a really great story. And then if I use that story as a model for what I'm going to teach throughout the day, and I'm able to come back to that story again and again, and point out the strategies I used in that story and how those strategies are directly applicable to the marketing plan that we are working on right now for your company, that's great. So we have to be entertaining. We have to find stories that are really intriguing. Uh, we have to find ways to creatively show the world to people in ways that maybe they haven't seen it before. All of these things make people wanna listen to us. The weird presumption that so many people have in this world is that people wanna listen to them. It is so odd to me that just because you rented the Javits Center and because you're standing on the stage and because there's 5,000 people in the audience, they just assume that the 5,000 people want to listen to you. If you assume at all times that no one wants to listen to you in any way whatsoever, you will raise your game in terms of being entertaining, which is, I think, the assumption we should all have. We should all assume no one wants to hear a word we have to say. And therefore, we have to try to find a reason to get them to listen to us. And when I say entertaining, it doesn't mean funny. It also means incredibly informative. It means revealing of information that they never had perceived before. It means showing them the world in a brand new way that they had never imagined before. It means holding them in suspense or creating wonder in their minds. There's a million ways to be entertaining and it's not necessarily just funny, but for goodness sake, if you're not trying to be entertaining, I promise you people aren't listening to you. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure we've all been on the other side of those corporate events where we've been in the audience and bored out of our minds. So hopefully that can maybe be the fuel for you to, to make sure you're not leading to that. Um, well, we're running out of time here, Matt. This has been great. I feel like I could listen to your stories all night, but um, I, I want to make sure everyone at home knows where they can e either get find out more about your stuff or connect with you. So where, where's the best place for people to get more information from you? Sure. They can find me at matthewdicks.com. Uh, they can find all my books, Story Worthy and Some Days Today are my two nonfiction titles, or all my books, wherever you get books or, you know, online. And my wife and I also have a storytelling podcast where you can go and learn storytelling. It's called Speak Up Storytelling. There's more than 100 episodes now. We play a story that's produced in one of our shows locally, and then we take that story apart and we talk about what's going on in that story that's well done and what, you know, what needs to be improved. But it's sort of a little a little masterclass each week on storytelling. And it's also entertaining because the stories we choose are always fun to listen to. Great. Well, I'll make sure I link to the podcast, the website, everything in the show notes and the, in the books as well. Um, well, the last question I have for you, and I ask every guest this, but what is one thing either personal or professional that you've, you've learned lately that's been a benefit to your life? The thing that I've learned, I guess it's, I don't know if it's a benefit to my life, but it's a thing that I've been sort of encouraging others in working with corporate clients, the weird thing I've discovered is I believe in the power of positive feedback. And so I'll be working with a client on a keynote 
And when they're done, I'll, the first thing I'll do is say three things they do well. And I just had a client last week say to me, you don't need to be easy on me, Matt. Just give me the stuff that I need to hear to fix. And I said to this guy, I said, you don't understand. When I give you positive feedback, I'm identifying a thing that you're doing well. And I'm telling you, you do it well. So you continue to do it. Because oftentimes in life, we do something well accidentally or unintentionally, or we don't understand how well we really did it. So we won't continue to do it. So positive feedback is a means of changing behavior. But what I've discovered when working with clients in the corporate world, the, the tendency almost exclusively is to say, here's what you need to do to make it better. And so often they view positive feedback as a compliment or a cushion for the critical feedback that will follow. When in truth, it is a critical way to change behavior and ensure that the things people are doing well continue to happen. And that is something I've sort of started driving home with a lot of my higher end clients who have a lot of direct reports who don't think this way. I actually got an email from a vice president about a month ago. And she said that the way you talked to me through my keynote and the positive feedback you gave me made me realize I should actually be doing this with my direct reports. It's not something I've ever done. And it was so helpful to me. And I think that was a wonderful email to get, but you have been in the industry for 15 years and you have not been giving positive feedback. No wonder we have a crisis where people are quitting and disenchanted with the jobs they're doing today because they're not being communicated in a way that makes them feel worthy and really helps them do a better job. So that's sort of the idea that I'm obsessing with right now is the idea of we have to change the perception of positive feedback. Well, that's a wonderful place for us to end the show. Well, Matt, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure hearing from you. And uh, hopefully we can do this again one day. Anytime. It was my pleasure. Absolutely. Well, thanks everybody at home. We'll see you next time.